Resident Evil Genesis, a novelization by Keith R. A. De Candido. Chapter 17. Rain was bored. When one told her and J.D. to keep an eye on the dumb cop while they went to shut down the little kid computer, she didn't say anything, because she didn't do that. One was the boss. Heck, one was the guy who got her the job. She'd take point heading into the gates of hell if that was the order he gave. But that didn't make this babysitting crap any less boring. So what the hell are you doing here? she asked Addison, who was sitting on one of the crates. The bozo tried to shrug while wearing cuffs, then winced in pain. J.D. grinned when he did that. We got a call. Some kind of disturbance at the big mansion in Foxwood Heights. My sergeant told me that I had to check it out. Rain laughed. What's so funny? Addison sounded all defensive. Rookie? Rain shook her head. You believe this? Our CPD pulls this crap all the time. What do you mean, rookie? J.D. pulled out his Smith & Wesson and checked the clip. You said you just transferred, right? Yeah, so? I've been a cop for ten years. I was a cop too, jerk. And I know that new in town means rookie. Don't matter how far into your pension you are from some other burg. Putting the clip back into his pistol, J.D. said, You, my friend, got hazed. Nobody's supposed to go to the mansion. They don't get calls. All the locals know that. Rain grinned. Except you. Then the lights went out. The only thing Rain could see were the display lights on the crates. J.D.'s voice sounded in the darkness. Guess Kaplan found the off button. The emergency lights came on. Yeah, well, sun shines on a dog's butt every once in a while. Kaplan wasn't that bad a guy, really, but he was a geek who didn't really belong in the field. Sure, he could hold his own in a firefight, but he was just about the last person Rain wanted covering her. She trained a kid just like Kaplan when she was a cop. All eager beaver with lots of reins, but no sense. For this kind of work, you needed nerves of steel. Kaplan's were made of tin. Rain noticed that the indicators on the crates went from environment stable in green to environment unstable in red. Pulling out her knife, she started to scrape dirt out from under her thumbnail. She was bored again. They're late. J.D. said. Rain checked her watch. They had one hour, twenty-seven minutes before the hive would be sealed off. Then she heard a noise, like metal clanging on the floor. She put away the knife and pulled out her MP5K. I'm on it. Of all the weapons she'd wielded both as a cop and as Umbrella Security, nothing felt more comfortable in Rain's hands than the MP5K. Stepping over the thick tubes that went from the crates into the floor, or to the other crates, Rain moved around, trying to find out where the noise came from. She heard it again, and turned right, moving toward it. The third time she heard the noise, she saw the metal cylinder rolling on the floor. Holding the rifle up, ready to blow holes into whatever got in her way, she walked forward. Turning around one of the crates... She saw a woman leaning against one of the smaller crates, head down. She wore a lab coat and an all-white outfit, just like the corpse in the flooded lab. This one was brunette, though, and she was alive. Lowering the rifle, Rain called back, J.D., we got a survivor. Then she turned back to the woman and began to slowly approach her. It's okay. We're here to help. The woman almost fell into Rain's arms. She caught the woman, guided her up by gripping her on either side of the head. Damn if her skin wasn't cold and clammy. And she was paler than Warner, and white folks didn't get any paler than Warner. Keeping her best you'll be okay voice on, honed from years dealing with the public for LAPD, she said, Don't worry, 
You seem to be in some sort of a- Ah! She screamed when the woman bit her on the right hand, smacked between her thumb and index finger. Bit her. Rain couldn't believe it. Rain tried to knock her down, but the crazy lady had some kind of iron grip on her, and they both fell to the floor, rolling around like some kind of mud wrestling match. Get off! As they struggled, Rain noticed that the crazy lady's eyes were all watery and messed up. Her teeth looked like something had died in her mouth, and she wasn't just pale. She was ghost-like. Get off me! She heard someone running up to them. Taking a quick glance up, she saw that it was J.D. J.D., get her off of me before I stab her! Grabbing her by the lab coat, J.D. tossed the crazy lady off to the side. Then he looked down at Rain. Are you okay? Rain quickly got to her feet. She bit me, man! She took a chunk clean right out of me! The crazy lady rolled over. J.D. took out his Smith & Wesson, pointing it right at her. Stay down. She didn't listen, but started to get to her feet. I'm warning you, J.D. said. Stay down. Rain shook her head. She's crazy. Come any closer and I'll fire, J.D. said as she started walking toward him. No, she wasn't walking. Nobody walked like that. She was... She was shuffling, like some kind of late-night movie zombie monster. This was getting too weird for Rain. I mean it! J.D. spoke those words as if it mattered, but Rain knew he shouldn't have bothered. This woman was nuts. She moved closer and closer. J.D. shook his head, aimed his pistol downward, and fired. The shot went clean through her knee. Normal people would react to a three fifty seven Magnum bullet tearing through their knee by stumbling, falling to the floor, and screaming in deep pain. It was a cripple shot, and it usually meant the victim would never walk again. But she just stumbled for a second, snarled, showing teeth stained with Rain's own blood, and then kept moving forward. J.D. mouthed the words, What the? Rain couldn't blame him for not being able to say anything. This was beyond nuts. After her second step, J.D. shot her in the other knee. This time, it didn't even slow her down. J.D. took three more shots at her, this time in the chest. Rain was tired of messing around. She hefted her MP5K, paused just long enough to make sure it was on automatic, and then squeezed the trigger. <laughs> Dozens of bullets slammed into the crazy lady's chest, blowing her back about ten feet and sending her sprawling into the tubing that was all over the floor of this dining hall. She looked over at J.D. with a triumphant look, but he barely noticed. I shot her five times. How is she still standing? Rain reached into one of her arm pouches and pulled out a bandage. She isn't standing now. More footsteps. It was Addison. She was about to ask him what the hell he was doing when Alice, Kaplan, and Spence ran up behind him. Rain wondered where the rest of the team was. What was all the shooting? Kaplan asked. We found a survivor. Kaplan looked at her like she was nuts. And you shot him? She was crazed. She bit me. She's gone. Rain looked over at J.D. when he spoke. He had just walked over to where the crazy lady had fallen. She's gone, he said again. That's bull. You didn't shoot someone three dozen times just to have them get up and walk off. That didn't play. She fell right here, and now she's gone. Look at this, Alice said. It's blood, but not much. The cop squatted down to take a closer look. Looks like it's coagulated, but that's not possible. J.D. sounded pissed off when he asked, Why not? Rain already knew the answer, but let Matt the Wonder Detective take it. Because blood doesn't do that till after you're dead. 
Spence looked bored. Can we go now? We ain't going anywhere till the rest of the team get here. As Rain spoke, she loaded another clip into the MP5K. She was for damn sure not getting caught without a full load. When she saw the look on Kaplan's face, he looked like someone strangled his favorite pet. For that matter, Alice and Spence looked all uncomfortable now, too. Finally, Kaplan said, There's no one else coming. What the hell are you talking about? Wait. J.D. grabbed her shoulder. Quiet. Then Rain heard it, too. Metal scraping against metal. Raising her rifle, she turned and saw it. A tall, bald guy dragging a fire axe on the floor behind him. He was wearing a white lab coat and white outfit under it, too. Though his was all wet and filthy, the guy's shoulder was all messed up, and his right foot was perpendicular to his leg, like he'd broken his ankle. But he didn't seem to feel it. Behind him, she saw more. Just like the crazy lady, they all kind of shuffled. They all had milky eyes, and they all had messed up teeth and some of them were injured, fatally injured. This was in the next county after nuts. One guy had half his head carved out. Another was missing his right eye and his entire nose. Nobody was bleeding, though. Any blood she'd seen was coagulated. Hell, J.D. muttered. Don't come any closer. Kaplan sounded like a total moron. They're behind us. Spence pointed out. Jesus, Kaplan muttered. They're everywhere, Alice added, stating the obvious like it was some kind of revelation. Guys, they're everywhere. They're all around us. Then the crazy lady, lab coat and white outfit full of bullet holes, jumped Rain. This time, Rain grabbed her by the head and twisted until she heard the snap of her neck bone. She didn't get up this time. Then she flipped the MP5K to semi-automatic. She was going to need to conserve ammo with this many people, and fired on the big bald guy right in the chest. He fell to the floor. Then he got back up. Damn, damn, damn. Kaplan, still in total moron mode, yelled, I said stay back. Then he took a few shots with his Beretta. Watch the tanks, Alice cried. Rain didn't give a crap about the tanks. She just wanted these whatever the hell they were dead or deader. Damn, this was messed up. These things kept getting back up. She and JD exchanged a look. Without even having to speak, they knew what to do. Can't kill him, at least clear a path. So they switched their rifles to automatic and concentrated their fire on one area, plowing down these shuffling monsters one by one. Let's go, J.D. yelled, even as Rain cried, Hurry up! Then, one of the tanks exploded. Chapter 18 Matt Addison had been trying to unlock himself when the tank exploded. At some point during her struggle with the woman who bit her, Rain's keys had fallen off her person. Matt noticed the keys lying there on the floor as soon as he, Kaplan, Alice, and Spence joined J.D. and Rain. His opportunity came when Alice pointed out the blood. On the pretense of squatting down to take a closer look at it and to show off his knowledge as a detective by imparting his brilliant bit of wisdom about coagulated blood, even though that was something he remembered from high school biology, he palmed the keys and had been working to free himself ever since. At least, he'd convinced the security goons that he was a legit cop. The hazing story worked like a charm, and he hadn't even had to supply the details. Rain and J.D. knew the RCPD well enough to fill in the blanks. Sending a neophyte detective on a fake call to the infamous mansion you stayed away from was a run-of-the-mill prank and Matt knew there were enough ex-cops in security division's employ for that to be common knowledge. Now, though, things were just getting too weird. He knew that Umbrella was into some hardcore stuff, but this? As the numbers of people stumbling toward them grew, 
Mac came to several realizations. The first was that these people were all wearing suits or lab coats over all-white jumpsuits. He knew from Lisa that Umbrella had a dress code, unusual in the post.com world of business casual, but not unheard of, matching that of these people's clothing. The other was that they were already dead. When he was a kid, one of Matt Addison's favorite words was Zuvembi. He came across it in a lot of the comic books he read when he was a child, and it referred to reanimated dead bodies. In later years, he would learn of the word zombie, mostly from horror movies, and later still discovered that the comics called them Zuvembis only because they weren't allowed to use the word zombie. The Comics Code Authority established in the 1950s that kept comics G-rated forbade that word, and some bright mind at one of the comics companies made up a synonym that was similar enough to convey the meaning without actually violating the code. Twelve-year-old Matt, picking up some monster comic or other, just thought it was a really, really cool word. Now, decades later, he found himself confronted with real-life Zuvembis. More than ever, he needed to get out of these damn cuffs and ditch these gonzos so he could find Lisa's desk and get to the bottom of this. Umbrella's fingers were in things much worse than he, Aaron, and the rest of them could possibly have dreamed of if this was the kind of thing coming out of the hive. He was pretty close to finally getting the cuffs off, no mean feat when you have basically no leverage whatsoever, when one of the tanks blew up. Alice, who seemed to be the only person in the group with anything like a brain, even with the drag effect of her amnesia, warned them to beware of the tanks, but nobody listened, and one of them exploded, sending Matt onto his back. Glancing around quickly, he caught sight of the keys and crab-walked his way back to where they were, under a table. A zombie followed him and tried to reach in under the table and pull him out. Said zombie was wholly undeterred by the fact that he was on fire. Matt kicked at the zombie and tried to grab the keys, but succeeded only in knocking the ladder into a vent. Splitting his focus, he reached into the vent for the keys while continuing to kick the zombie. Eventually, he succeeded in both endeavors. The zombie's neck broke from one of the kicks, which stopped it coming after him, and he managed to grab the keys. The bad news was, now his leg was on fire. He couldn't do a damn thing about it while bound, so he fumbled agitatedly with the keys, hoping the fire didn't spread past his right shin, knowing that it was a pretty slim hope. But he for damn sure wasn't dying down here, not until he find out what happened to Lisa. It was one thing to be prepared for something to go wrong. That was almost a given. His boss at the federal marshal's office always used to say, Plan A never works. This, however, was several orders of magnitude beyond something going wrong. Arriving at the mansion to find some woman dressed like she was going to a cocktail party or something, then being attacked by the security goons from hell, and finally reliving Day of the Dead, wasn't even on the contingency plan list. He got the cuffs unlocked. Then he tamped down the fire on the leg of his pants before it could spread to even less comfortable regions of his body. Pausing to take a breath, he saw that three more zombies had decided to take a shot at him. Then another arm grabbed his shoulder and pulled him out. Alice. Come on. Nodding, he let her lead the way, away from the zombies. He couldn't see any of the rest of the goon squad. Where is everybody? I lost track of Rain, J.D., Kaplan, and Spence. Matt nodded. What about the rest of them? The team leader, the medic, and the other two goons were still unaccounted for. They're dead. That got Matt's attention. All they were doing was shutting down the damn computer. Did the zombies get them too? No, that wasn't possible. The zombie attack was a surprise to everyone. So how the hell had those four gotten themselves killed? Matt's urgency increased a hundredfold. Umbrella hadn't just built an underground headquarters in order to hide their research. They'd built a death trap. Five hundred employees and now four of their security people, with six of them left and in serious danger of joining them. He and Alice made their way out into a corridor. As soon as the opportunity presented itself, he slipped away. Alice didn't follow him, so he definitely gave her the slip. 
right now his priority was Lisa's desk. She had described her office space to him in her encrypted email, including the route there from the elevator bay. Finding that was only the work of a few minutes. It came complete with another fake window and fake cityscape. Then he traced the route she had provided. He found himself in an area full of boring metal desks with paper, file folders, staplers, phones, cords, inboxes, disks, and various other items strewn haphazardly about the floor. With no idea which one was Lisa's, he investigated the desks themselves. Most of them had some kind of personal object to indicate the personality of the user, and Matt knew that Lisa's own desk had a picture of her, Matt, Mom, and Dad from a cruise they'd taken when she and Matt were teenagers. Matt tried not to think about what he was doing as he looked at pictures of a man with his dog, a woman with her children, Beanie Babies, a pennant from the minor league baseball team that played in Raccoon City, and all the other personal items of people who were not only dead, but still up and walking around, biting people or getting shot at by the likes of Rain and J.D. He got to one desk, which had a computer with a broken monitor on it. No sign of a picture, but he found the next best thing, Lisa's ID badge. Squatting down at the file cabinet next to her desk, he started going through her files, hoping to be able to salvage something from this nightmare. A thud scared him out of what few years of life he still had left. One of Lisa's Zuvembi co-workers was banging on the window next to her desk. However, the zombie was cut off from Matt by the window, and seemed content to simply bang on it rather than try to find an alternate route. So Matt let him. He had more important things to deal with. Or so he thought. Lisa's files were all meaningless to him. They probably related to her actual job, nothing about a T-virus or anything like that. Of course, she wouldn't keep anything like that at her desk. She wasn't that stupid. Unfortunately, that meant he had nothing that he could take back to Aaron. This was not shaping up to be a good day at all. Hearing movement behind him, he whirled around, ready to face another zombie, hoping he could fend it off with a stapler or a keyboard or something else, since J.D. had disarmed him back at the mansion. Then he saw who it was. Lisa? She stood in the middle of the space amidst the office supplies festooned about the floor looking completely normal. A little distressed, but that was to be expected. Had she actually survived this? Had one thing actually gone right today? Matt got up. Then Lisa jumped him and tried to bite him with decaying teeth. <laughs>